We can't do this without him. This whole thing, this whole journey of life, and the seasons that we're in today, we can't do it without him. And sometimes the hardest thing for us to recognize and to realize is that the longer we try and go without him, the worse we make it for ourselves. Tonight, let's open our hearts, finally, once and for all, to the promises, to the rest, to the, the peace and the joy that God has promised for you. You know that God has promises for you and they're still intact today. Nothing you have done is, is making those promises null and void in your life. These promises are still intact for you. God is saying, I have rest for you. I have a new life for you. I have a new plan for your life today. Just trust in God. Build your life on Him. And He'll make your path straight. How many believe that we can build our life on Him and things will be okay? Let's pray this, morning, this, this evening. God, we just thank you. There's nobody like you. There's no one that can do this like you can. No one that can get us through the season that we're in. God, I thank you that tonight we're coming here ready and prepared to receive a word from you. Father, I pray that you would speak, that you would have your way. God, right now, I humble myself before you. I thank you, God. You're going to go ahead and push me over to the side, Holy Spirit, and you take this mic because, God, we're ready to receive a word from you tonight. In Jesus' name, if you agree with that, just give God some praise. Say amen if you're ready to hear from the Lord tonight. Come on, why don't we give God one more shout of praise this tonight. He's a good and faithful God. He's so good. I'm so glad that you're here. Why don't you go ahead and give your neighbor a high five as you make your way to your seat. And tell them, man, I like your, I like your hair. That's some cool hair. If they don't got hair, just tell them, you got a cool smile. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday night service. Powerful nights on Wednesday nights. We want to remind you that you can invite friends and family. I believe that this place should be full. There should never be a service that we don't invite people to come and hear the word of God. So let's make it a point that we're inviting and we're letting people know that the best place to be on a Wednesday night is right here in the house of God. How many know this is the best place to be? My name is Pastor Christian. I'm one of the pastors here at The Way. And I just want to give honor to Pastor Marco and Pastor Lisa, the best pastors in the world. Can we hear it for our pastors? They're amazing. Today we're continuing our series of healthy families. Someone say healthy families. Today we're going to talk about how God created the family. We're going to look at how God created our families. But we know this. No family is perfect. Some families are okay. Most of our families are crazy. Well, some will say amen. Some more crazy than others. But even in scripture, you'll find that there is no perfect family. It doesn't take long to find an imperfect family. Started with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were in the garden. Eve gave Adam the fruit. Adam starts blaming Eve for all of his problems. They're kids, they have kids, one of the kids murders the other. Fast forward, there's more stories in the Bible of just families that are broken, hurting, and lost. So you're in good company if you have a crazy family because that's all over scripture too. But here's the great thing about the word of God is that the word of God shows us that we do not have to settle for the condition that our families are in right now. But our families can grow our families can be restored, we can improve, and here's this, this may sound like a miracle for you, but there can be forgiveness and reconciliation even in your family. How many believe that? So when we study the Word of God, we see no perfect family, but we also see the promises of God unfolding. Today we're going to talk about what that looks like. But in order to see that come to pass in your family and in your home, there needs to come and stir up within you 
a fight. Someone say fight. In order to get the prize, in order to win the war that the enemy has waged against your family, there needs to stir up a fight from within you to make sure that my family will not be destroyed any longer. Someone say fight. We got to fight for our families. My family growing up, just to share a little background for me, when I was born, I was born in maybe what looks like a picture-perfect family. I had mom and dad in the home. I was born into a house. It was, it was new houses in Bloomington. They were new at the time, not new anymore. I'm getting older now. <laughs> new house in Bloomington. We had a pool. We had two dogs, brothers and sisters. It was a picture-perfect, happy, happy family. But that didn't last long. Around three or four years old, my parents split. They separated, and that led to a downward spiral. The enemy took a hold of my family. My mom ended up becoming addicted to drugs. She depended on alcohol every day. Every day, every time we jump in the car, she would reach in the glove compartment, shoot back some Bacardi. Every time we were home at night, she would get home from work. I don't know how she did it. She would still work, but she'd get home, and we'd see her late at night. She'd go into her room sane, and she would come out high. And my dad was totally overwhelmed with depression and anger. He ended up becoming addicted to smoking. He would eventually develop lung cancer, and he would pass away at the age of 32 when I was nine years old. I'm 30 right now. I'm approaching the age my dad passed away. My family began to spiral out a, a crazy. My brothers and sisters, they, every, all of us found different ways to cope with the life that we were dealt. And I understand, and I'm not trying to say that I'm in your shoes and that we have similar stories, and maybe some of us have similar stories. Maybe your story is worse than mine. Maybe you've been dealt a different kind of hand that I've been dealt, but it doesn't matter. I know this to be true, that the promises of God are still intact today. And what God did in my home and my family and how he restored us and God has brought us back to hope and faith in life, he can do in your family. No family is too far from God to rescue, restore, and rebuild. God isn't too far off from you and you're not too far off from God. It looked like hope was gone, but I'm here to remind you that hope is still intact. There's some principles we're going to read in, about in Scripture that show us and reveal to us, that teach us about families. And today we're going to learn about how we can fight for our families. I want to start off with my first point. God created the family. The family didn't happen by chance. The family is not a result of evolution. The family was designed and manufactured by the creator of the universe. When God created the family, it was the first institution ever established on this earth. And of all the institutions we see today, like the government, like countries all over the world, like empires, even the church, of all of the institutions, the family was the first, the most durable, the strongest, the most dependable, and the one thing that God would decide to build everything else upon, the family. God designed the family. He created the family. So we can see in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. And so the family was born. But a godly family, we know this, a godly family is one of the, most, the strongest, most durable institutions that have ever hit this earth. A strong godly family. Look at Matthew chapter 7 verse 24. It says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house. Someone say, build a house. 
We're talking about our homes, our houses, our families, like someone who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain come, the rain comes in torrents and floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house. Anyone ever feel like there's some winds beating against your house? Some torrents or some storms that are rising up and coming against your home and your family? It may come in the form of division. It may come in the form of offense and unforgiveness. It may even come in the form of infidelity. It may come in the form of betrayal, hurt, pain. I don't know what kind of storm is coming against your home and your family, but the scripture tells us this. Although it may be against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. The family's durable. It's meant to last. God created it to last. As a matter of fact, the families have lasted even, even though countries don't last, a family will. You know that in scripture, a family survives Sodom and Gomorrah. The family survived the great flood of the earth. Everything was destroyed except the family. And I believe that with God, your family can survive anything, any storm, any fight, and anything that will come its way. God did not create your family to fail. He created your family to thrive, to grow, to prosper, to be healthy, to be united, to be full of love. And when we build our family on the bedrock of the word of God, which is Jesus Christ, then we can see our family thrive again. How many believe that to be true? I love this scripture. And actually, for the first time ever, I looked up what the word build meant in this, in the Greek. I was going to try and pronounce it, but I changed my mind right now. Is it up here? Yeah, you, you try. Did I say that right? Mike, was that right? No, I got it wrong. Okay. He's my spell check. This is what it means, though. It means to build a house. Or to build up from the foundation. A lot of us try to skip some steps when, our, when we're building our home. Have you ever got something like a furniture piece from Ikea or something like that? Or something on Amazon? And it got all the instructions. And you just start skipping steps. All of a sudden you get the thing and you're like dyslexic. You're like, you go from one to nine, back to four. And you're like, I don't know what to do here. And it's just falling apart. Well, there's an order to this. There's structure to it. And God has given our family order and structure. There's a design to the family. Remember, God manufactured it. So he's got a manual for you. It's called the word of God. This word build means from the foundation, which means we have to start from the foundation. We have to build our families and our homes on the word of God upon Christ. Oh, come on. I don't know if that's good news or bad news. I don't know what that is, but this is the word of God. This is the only way our families are going to survive. This word build also means, and I love this, to restore, to rebuild, or to repair. That's good news for somebody in here. It could be that your family right now is sitting in a state of demolition, destroyed from the ground up, no beam sitting on top of one another, no hope for a home again. But this scripture is telling us here that we can not only build, but we can rebuild our homes, rebuild our families, rebuild our marriages, rebuild the relationship we once had with our kids, rebuild everything from the ground up. But it has to begin from the foundation. We have to come back to Christ in order to rebuild what God has designed for you. It has to start there. You can begin building and you can begin rebuilding. I've heard so many stories of what God can do in and through a family that has been broken. And one story I want to share with you is a very dearly loved member, members of this church, Reggie and Sheila Tatum. How many know Reggie and Sheila Tatum? 
Man of God and woman of God right there. Their story is incredible. What God did in and through their marriage is, is amazing. You see them, this is at our last Valentine's dinner. The, our, our, uh, you have married couples and engaged couples. This is our last one in February. And you would look at this picture and you would just see a loving, just a, look, look at them. They're amazing. But what you don't maybe not know is that they got married back in 1986 and they were separated for years because of infidelity. Years they were separated. Broken, demolished home. Not a lot of people can bounce back from that. As a matter of fact, I'll go as far to say this. In our own strength, I don't think any of us could. But they leaned on the Lord. They depended on God. And they got reconciled together. These past seven years, they got reconciled. And now for the past four years, they've been doing ministry together. Not only that, but they're making disciples and they're leaders in our marriage ministry. Come on, if that doesn't sound like a restored, a rebuilt house, and I don't know what is, and if God can do it for them, he can do it for you. But what does it take? It takes somebody willing to step up and fight for their family. Someone has to step up and say, I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to throw in this towel. I'm not going to quit in the middle of my fight. I'm going to keep fighting because I know God has a promise for my home. And I'm going to stand on that promise if that's the last thing I do. Come on, I wonder if we got any fighters in here. I'm going to move this pulpit before I smash it. You know, the amazing thing about the way God designed a family is that the, thank you, he's like, what is it? I love that, he's all in. He or she, I don't know, I thought it was a little boy, I don't know who it was. <laughs> all, all societies depend on the strength of the family. I'll put it this way, if the home is broken, then the nation is broken. In other words, when you mess with the family order, you're actually messing with the country's well-being. The condition of the society or the nation or the country that we see today in our country and in countries all over the world is a direct reflection of the condition of our homes and our families. God did not design the institution of a family to depend on the country or the government or our schools. He designed the country and he designed the nations to depend on the health of godly families thriving in homes. I don't think we recognize and realize how, how drastic and how important the health of your home is, not just to your kids, but to the health of this entire city and the country. San Bernardino is better when your family is better. Rialto's better. Fontana's better. California's better. America's better. Arizona's better. Uh, all over the world is better when your family is surrendered to the word of God. I don't think we realize that, but it's true. Look at, look at these crazy stats of fatherless homes. Just some proof that broken families lead to destruction. 85% of youth who are currently in prison grew up in a fatherless home. We're just talking about eliminating the father. Look what else happens. 75% of adolescents are treated for substance abuse, that are treated for substance abuse, they come from a fatherless home. 85% of all children who have a behavioral disorder come from a fatherless home. Look at this one. 90% of youth who run away or who become homeless eventually come from a fatherless home. 63% of all youth suicides come from a fatherless home. When the families are destroyed, our children are destroyed, our nation is destroyed, 
Our societies are destroyed. Our cities are destroyed. Church, I, I don't, I, I'm not trying to be dramatic here, but the world is depending on your family living for God. The world is depending on, on you fighting to rebuild your family. It's going to take a fight. It's going to take some sacrifice, I know. But if we don't do it, no one else will. No one's going to come into your home and fight for your home. No one's going to come into your marriage and fight for your marriage for you. It's going to take somebody stepping up and saying, I'm not going to let this unforgiveness or this hurt or this pain, I'm not going to let this go. I'm not going to let this destroy me, my family, my city, and my future. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to fight for my family. Do I got any fighters in this place tonight? We got to fight for our families. The problem, one of the big problems we have today is that our government is trying to redefine the family. We have, we have so many restructurings of the way families are supposed to look according to our day and age. Redefining who is who and what is what and what I'm called and what my identity is. But the reality is this. Before, remember, before the government existed, the family was already established by God. The government should never raise your family. It's your responsibility to raise your family. Your family right now, here's a scary reality, is being kidnapped by the government if we just sleep. What does that word kidnap mean? I define it because I wanted, to, I wanted you to understand what's happening. It's being abducted, carried off, taken away illegally by force. See, when the enemy is trying to raise your kids, what he's actually doing is he's, he's illegally trespassing into your home and he's, he's defying the laws of God and the order that God has established for your family and he wants to kidnap your family. But God established a family for you to raise up your children, you to speak life, husbands, speak life into your wife, wives, to submit and love your husbands. But the enemy is trying to kidnap, to destroy, to invade our families. We can't leave that up to the government. We can't leave that up to the schools. It's our job to raise our homes. Amen? The solution to all of our problems that we see, many of our problems we see in our country, is a restoration of God's design of family. Our job is to disciple our homes and to bring God back into our homes. God doesn't belong in a church that we just check in with him. It's like we're giving God visitation hours. God, I'm clocking in, I'm checking in my visitation hours. All my kids are gonna visit you on Wednesday night. We're going to check in online, and we're going to visit you Wednesday night. That's not where, God, see, God, the, 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 real, the real location, the real place that God wants to live is in your hearts and in your homes. And if God isn't residing in our homes, then where is he? We need to learn to invite the presence of God back into our homes and to make our homes a sanctuary where the presence of God dwells and his anointing thrives and demons are cast out and depression has to flee and no demon can prevail and, and we're conquering and we're breaking chains and bondages. Our homes can be that, but it takes a fight. Someone say fight. The family was designed by God to operate in that way to operate under his power. I wanna to go to point two. I know I'm taking my time here. I don't know if I'll finish, but let's keep going. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Number two, we're kind of already talking about this, already alluded to it, but it's no, it's, it's no surprise that the enemy wants to destroy your family. The enemy wants to destroy your family. He has an agenda to destroy the family so we must be on guard and protect our homes from his attack. Take a look at Nehemiah chapter 4. I'm going to start from verse 1. Just to give some context of what's happening here. You have Nehemiah. 
who re recognize that his people and his city, his nation is destroyed. It's in ruins. And God gives a, stirs up a fight from within him to rebuild and to restructure and to grow what the enemy has destroyed. So he assembles families, he assembles people together and they begin to rebuild and the enemy catches wind of this. And this is what happens. Sambalot was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. You know, the enemy is not gonna be happy when he finds out you've made a commitment to rebuild your home. He won't. But I don't want you to freak out about that because every battle you fight in the name of the Lord has already been won on your behalf. So don't worry, the fight's fixed. But let's keep going. He was angry. So he flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Sumerian army officers, what do this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Someone say, ooh, those are fighting words. Do they think they can build a wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? The enemy will sit there and mock what you have in your home. The enemy will sit there and speak lies and lies and lies and tell you, look at the rubbish, the heap of junk that's inside of your home. Do you think, do you really think that you can do anything with the cards that have been dealt to you? Do you really believe that God can redeem and restore the marriage that has already been broken? Do you think that God will ever bring you back to your kids and your kids will one day love you again? Do you think that'll actually happen? The enemy is such a liar. These are all lies. But he's speaking those lies. But half of, a, half of the battle is just recognizing that's a lie and it's not true. The enemy's objective is to get you to believe the lie so that you walk in it. Let's keep going. So it says, Tobiah the Ammonite who was standing beside him remarked that the stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked along the top of it. Skip down to verse 7. It says, But when Sambalot and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites and all the other ites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps of the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. Keep going to the middle of verse 10. It says, The, the people of Judah now. So now not only is the enemy speaking lies, but it may happen that someone in your home might start speaking lies. It may happen that in your home, there may be some complaining. Why do we got to go to church again? Why do we got to pray at the dinner time? Why do we got to do a Bible study as a family? I'm just, why do we got to do all this? It may happen even in your home. It says the workers, the people of Judah began to complain. The people on the inside, the people that Nehemiah were building with. It says the workers are getting tired. And there's so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build a wall by ourselves. There, there may be those voices outside and there may be those voices inside your home. But all it takes is just one person to believe enough in the promises of God that we can fight for something fresh and new, that we can see the life of God in our homes again, that we can see forgiveness and peace and restoration. All it takes is one person, and I hope that one person is sitting here hearing this message right now and saying, I believe that for my home. I'm gonna stand on it. I'm gonna believe for it. I don't care if my home's complaining or if the enemy is lying to me. I believe that my home will be restored in Jesus' name. I'm fighting for my kids, I'm fighting for my family, I'm fighting for my marriage. Come on, do we got any fighters in this place tonight? Fight for your family. <laughs> Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, and that's key, 
before they know what's taking place, before they recognize what's actually going on in their home. You know, one of the scariest things is that we don't realize every single day the enemy has already placed traps and assault to capture your kids, your family, and your marriages. We get assaulted nonstop on social media. We get assaulted nonstop when your kids are at school. The enemy is constantly discipling and pouring out his doctrine and his teaching and his word, his lies, and it is not truth, it's fake, but he's pouring it out upon our kids and our families. And if we're just sitting around waiting for God to come rescue us, waiting for something to fall out of the sky, then we won't even realize what's happening to our families right under our noses. It says before they even know what's happening. Verse 11, meanwhile, our enemy is saying, before they even know, before they even recognize, before they even see it, says we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. Goes on to say, the Jews who live near the enemy camp told us again and again, they will come from all directions and attack us. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, spears, and bows. You know that God has given you weapons. Why is there dust sitting on your weapons? You've been equipped with all the artillery of heaven, and not once have you called upon heaven to break the chains and the strong man that has been trying to destroy your family and your home. You know that with one call, with one cry to heaven, all of heaven will respond for your family to break the yoke that has been upon your children. God has given you the weapons. Use them. Fight for your family. I don't care. Uh, you know what? I I'm going to say this. I don't care if maybe you've seen it over and over. Maybe your grandparents were the same way. Maybe your parents were the same way my parents were. But I grew up saying this. I am not going to repeat that cycle. I am not going to let my marriage be destroyed. I am not going to let my kids repeat what my mom or dad did. I am not going to settle. I am not going to let it happen to my home. I will fight for my family. Pick up your weapons and fight for something it just takes one person to rise up and say I'm gonna fight for my home for some right now we got women of God that are in here maybe your family is in here you're a fighter keep fighting and don't throw in the towel for some, we got men of God in here right now, and you're hearing this message. I hope, I hope with all of my heart that you rise up and join the ranks in the army of God, and you step up to your potential, and you become the warrior that God has called you to be, and you become the soldier that is not afraid to step into the battlefield and say, where's that devil, that lying devil? Let me get a chance, and I'll get one swing at him. The last thing I'll do is let him touch my family. Where are those men of God at that are standing up and saying, I'm not going to let the devil touch my kids or touch my home. we got to fight for our families. He's leading an assault. But verse 14 says, Then as, as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said this, Don't be afraid of the enemy don't be scared of the enemy don't fear you know compared to God he's an ant he's nothing don't be afraid of his tactics don't be afraid of his lies as a matter of fact I would even say this don't be afraid of the traps that he's already set up and that you've already fallen for what God what the enemy used for evil God will turn around for good and just like Reggie and Sheila's testimony, one day your testimony can be that God restored your home, your kids, your family, and someone else will rejoice because what God did in your home. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Don't be scared of his tactics. Says this, remember the Lord who is great and glorious. Remember. Remember the Lord, what a powerful tool God has given us. 
to remember, to remember what he's done. What has God done in your life? What has he brought you out of? See, we need to get back to the point where we start keeping a list of all the wins that we've got in the spirit. I love that. I, I want to encourage you to do that. If you get a little win in your life, I think you should go ahead and write that down and say, I got another one. Oh, I got another win. Oh, the devil thought he had me, but he doesn't. The devil almost got my attitude, but he didn't get my attitude today. The devil, oh man, I almost, almost lashed out, but I didn't. I responded in love. That's another win for me. The devil thought he had me, but I got some wins. I'm keeping track. Come on, we got to keep track. Remember the Lord. Remember what he's done. Don't forget that if he's done it before, he can do it again. You get to the point you think it's all over for your family. Just remember Reggie and Sheila's story. Remember what God has done in your life. Just remember that God, if he's done it before, he can for sure do it again. And it says, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. Fight for your brothers, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives, and fight for your homes. We need a generation, we need a church, we need a people of God to get some fight back in their spirit and fight back in their heart. We need the church to rise up and be fighters again. We become consumers. We become binge watchers. All we do is binge watch. We become social media gurus. We become, oh, me, me, me. We become, look at me, love me. But we stop fighting. We need someone to step up and fight for the people in your home, people in your family, the people that are around you. It's time to fight. Someone say, it's time to fight. See, no one's going to take charge in your home except you. I'm going to ask you this. If someone tried to invade your house, what would you do? And for parents, you got kids, dads, you got daughters. I don't even got a daughter, but just imagining if someone tried to get in my house and touch my wife or touch my dog or, <laughs> or my shoes. <laughs> I don't care what he could touch. I don't care. I don't care. He could touch a, I don't care if he touches the bill. He cannot touch my house. If, if, let me ask you this. If an invader came into your home, just think about that. The last thing you're going to let anybody do in your home is touch your family. I will go down. I will, I will, I'm to, I, 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 I. it ain't happening, right? Come on. It is not happening. You're not getting in my home. You're not going to touch my family. It is not going down like that. I'm going to die before I let anybody touch my home. We believe that, right? Then why have you let the devil invade your home untouched? Not only that, why, if we're so passionate about protecting our families, have we left the back door open so the enemy can creep in with no problems? Think about that. If we're serious about protecting our homes, then we need to seriously train up our family to fight. You know, I think, mo 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 I'm going to be wrapping up soon, don't worry. <laughs> I think some of us are more interested in our kids being professional athletes, our kids being professional boxers, learning how to fight in the streets physically, but they're getting killed spiritually. Some of us dads are more interested in our kids learning how to spit game, but we don't know how to speak an ounce of word of God coming out of our mouth. Your kids are getting ransacked by the devil. But it's okay because he looks cool and he's good at school and he's a, he's a fighter in, in the boxing ring and he's good at sports. But he's getting ransacked by the devil spiritually. It's time for us to wake up, open our eyes, and realize this one thing. It's up to you to fight 
for your family, for your marriage, and for your kids. Don't let anyone or anything touch them. Someone say, fight for your family. I didn't get to my last point, but praise the Lord. Man, I need a rag up here. Hallelujah. How many received something from the word of God today? Now, we're in this series for a reason, and I believe that God is speaking to this to us for a, such a time as this. God is preparing the church, and I believe the enemy has already released an assault on our homes and our families. And what we're doing is learning to bring that fight of that soldier back out of us and to fight for our families so that we can have some healthy families again. What I want to do is the worship team is preparing spiritually in the back and they're coming up here. What I want to do is I want us to recognize something that no one else is going to fight for your home except you. Tonight, it's time for you to respond to this call. God is ready to raise up a warrior from within you to fight for your home. And I want to call upon everybody in here tonight who is saying, I'm ready to stand up for my home, for my marriage, for my kids. And I'll even go as far to say this, if you're single, I'm, I'm standing up, I'm fighting for the future family because maybe I haven't been guarding my own heart and I haven't been protecting me and I haven't been closing the door to the enemy in my own life and it's time for me to wake up and realize my choices now will affect my tomorrow and I'm done playing games with God. I'm done playing games and I'm gonna stand up and be a fighter for my future home, whether you're now home or your future home. If you're saying that's me, I'm ready to learn to be a fighter. I haven't been, but it's time for me. I just want you to raise your hand up. Say, that's me, that's me. I need to fight for my home, that's me. I see all those hands. I see all those hands. Saying, I don't got to fight. I haven't been doing it, but it's time for me to do it. It's time for me to step up. Can we do this? Can we all stand to our feet tonight? Everybody that raised your hand, what we're going to do, I want you to join the ranks of the army of God. I want you to make a statement of faith by leaving your seat and coming up to the front here today. And what you're doing is you're standing at attention to the general, which is Jesus. It's not me. It's general. It's Jesus Christ. And he's calling you to attention and he's saying, you haven't been fighting, but it's time for you to join the ranks, join the army, and be a fighter for your home. If you raise your hand, leave your seat right now and come on front, come on up to the front. Let's give them a round of applause. These fighters, these fighters, these are fighters. Thank you, brother. Love you, man. I will build my life come on, these are fighters. These are warriors. Some holy warriors here tonight. When I look up here and I see everybody that's up here, I, I just, I get so excited because your weapon, it's like I just see those weapons getting dusted off. They're getting oiled up. They're getting polished, ready for battle. And know this, that God will go before you. God has already prepared the way. The victory is purchased for you. It's bought, it's done, and it's won. All we need to do is fall in line with what this word says right here. And by you responding and coming up here tonight, what you're saying is, I'm ready to do whatever it takes to fight for my home and my family. I'm gonna do what God's word says. I'm gonna respond in faith knowing that my home is gonna get rebuilt and I'm fighting for my family. You guys are fighters. Some, if you're up here, why don't you say this with me? Say, I'm a fighter. You know what fighters do? They train. Fighters train. I don't know what the exact number is, but the average UFC fighter only spends maybe seconds, maybe a minute in the octagon, in the actual ring, on the pay-per-view fight. It's like the average, if you average it all up, it's seconds or minutes. 
but they spend years of their life dedicated to training. What does that mean? The battle in your life may only last moments, but only the champions, the cha oh, it's only those that are in training that become champions. Your job is to get into some training, and that's what we're gonna do. There's someone in front of you, they're gonna pray with you. We got many more up here that, that maybe need someone to pray with them. Um, so if we get some leaders up here, that'd be great. But what I want you to do, if you have not already, your job is to join Holy Warriors. That's your training. That's your boot camp. And Holy Warriors is gonna equip you to be a fighter like you've never fought before. If you've done Holy Warriors 1, it's time for Holy Warriors 2. If you've done that, it's time for Holy Warriors 3. If you've done Holy Warriors 3, it's time to become a leader. Start training some fighters. The person in front of you, they're gonna get you signed up for that. They're gonna help you take your next step. Are we ready to join the ranks? Are we ready to get trained and fight? I'm gonna make one last call in just a few moments. If you're ready, if you wanna just be forgiven of your sins, you wanna receive Jesus Christ tonight, if you were to die tonight and you don't know where you would go, call upon Jesus. You can't save yourself. We've all sinned. We need Jesus to forgive us of our sins. If you're ready to receive Jesus Christ, put your faith in him and give him your whole life. Tonight when I count to three or if you're up here already, just raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand. You're saying, I, got, I want to give my life to Jesus. I see all those hands up here. Love that. They're up here already. Come on, let's give them a round of applause. They're giving their life to Jesus and fighting for their homes. Let's do this. We're gonna pray. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, God, I'm ready to join the fight. Forgive me for sitting back while my family is being attacked. No longer will I just sit and watch, but I'll rise up as the fighter that you've called me to be. I receive your gifts, your strength, your power, and I will equip and arm up with the weapons that you have given me and the armor that you have given me to fight this fight. I believe in you, Jesus. I confess you as Lord, and I put my faith in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, and amen. Come on, church, can we just give God one more final shout of praise? Where are all my fighters at? If you're a fighter in this place, just give God one more shout of praise. We love you, church. God bless you. If you need prayer, come up. We'd love to pray with you. Don't forget, invite somebody to service. Let's pack this place out. There should not be an empty seat in the house. Let's let everybody know about what God is doing in the house. We'll see you guys Sunday. An amazing service plan for you this Sunday. It's going to be incredible. And for all the men that are going to men's camp, we'll see you this weekend at men's camp. Love you, love you, love you. If you need prayer, come on up. We do need more prayer workers. If you're a leader, a DG leader, an altar worker, a future pastor, I don't know what you are, an evangelist, come.